right. okay when did you yeah. you know, uh, let's call the meeting to order go ahead and uh with roll call go right. ahead and do Kate. oh sorry go ahead Faye. all right casey banks present megan markle present judy brown here larry hampton here randy rickert here and we still have a vacant student commissioner so okay uh next up we have approval of minutes from the october 24th meeting hopefully you've had a chance to look at those i know again some of you weren't part of that so you're gonna have to trust us or something i don't think i was there actually for that one do we um, abstain uh you are welcome to abstain if you weren't here that would probably be the appropriate thing to do mm -hmm. although are we gonna have let's how many votes do we have to have to pass it? It's uh, half plus one. Okay. Um, especially since we're at a total of five people. So we would need, we would so just we need, need three. three. Okay. All right. Um, would entertain a motion if anybody wishes to do so to approve the minutes or if there's anything that needs to be addressed in them? I move we approve the October 24, 2003, 23 meeting minutes. All right. Is there a second? I'll, sec I'll second that. Okay. Thanks. Um, any discussion about them before we vote? All right. All in favor, let's go with raising our hand since we can see each other. Okay. Are there any opposed? And ex uh, abstentions, two. Okay. All mm -hmm. right. So that passes. Thank you. Uh, now the really important part. We need to elect a new chair and vice chair. Anybody just have a burning desire for this position? It's, I can uh, run the meeting. I can be a chair if nobody else would like to. I was going to say, it, you know, frankly, does not necessarily call for a lot of extra time above what just serving on the commission is. Uh, and, and again, agendas are provided for us. It's just more kind of going through the agenda. So, yeah, if, if anybody... There, um, and Judy, for not, you know, it it uh, it wouldn't, it isn't the worst thing to have somebody that has at least a year of experience in it. But also, like I said, the way the, the and as closely as we work with city staff, I think somebody doesn't have to necessarily have been on it before. So, if someone else would like to do that, I know how to run meetings. I've done been on board chairs, but I haven't been part of this committee. So somebody who's been part of this committee, maybe they would like to be the chair. I can definitely help with being vice chair. So I've done vice chair this past year. Um, I know that I'm not going to be, I'm highly unlikely to be able to be at the April meeting, but I foresee the other ones to be okay. Um, so I'm open, willing, not chomping at the bits. <laughs> Again, I don't want to, I'm not trying to talk anybody out of it or into it either way. I just, um, uh, yeah. Then I nominate Casey Banks. <laughs> All right. Is there a second? I'll second that. All right. Um, and, and Clay, do you want, should we, yeah, do, do the chair and then do the vice chair, not do them necessarily together? Is that probably? Mm -hmm. With independent motions that all keeps it a little clear for everybody yeah. rather than yeah. kind of double yeah. barreling it. Okay. Any other any questions or any other discussion? Seeing none, all in favor of Casey serving as the chair of the Affordable Housing Commission for this next year, please raise your hand. 
Any opposed? Casey, are you opposed or are you abstaining? <laughs> it's providing instruction to my child, actually. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, I get, I, you know what? I get to turn it over to you now. I can stop being the one to. <laughs> All righty. Um, well, now we'll entertain a motion for a vice chair nomination. I didn't hear anybody else, you know, really jumping at it. So I, I mean, I would nominate Judy as the vice chair. Do I hear a second? Second. I'll second that. Yeah. All right. All in favor, please raise your hands. Any abstentions? I think that was everyone's hands. Great. Well, Judy, I look forward to serving you with you this year. And again, I'm very likely not to be at that April meeting. So that'll be on you. So um, be ready, Judy. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, Clay, do we have any public comments? I'm gonna. Uh, I didn't see anyone in the gallery. I don't believe we received any in the materials. Faye, do you see anyone in the wings waiting for us? No, there's no one on uh, the Zoom. Okay. No public comments then. All right, ready for our updates. Okay, so uh, I'm kind of working down through the memo. So I'm kind of going off of the way that Doug has typically prepared your agenda packet in the past, and so it's. Nice to meet all of you. If the only time I got to meet you was the joint work session we had in December or the recent orientation, then nice to see you again in your in your affordable housing commissioner setting. The um, the first thing I wanted to do was actually pull from the memo and then go into the update on the CET if you don't mind. And that is just to say that we have a new community development director that's scheduled to start with us on February 5th. And so I'm leading on this one, but he may be leading in the next uh, meeting that comes up for you all. And then I also wanted to introduce Leanne Wagner, who some of you from December may have met, but Leanne is taking a role in helping us out with some of the affordable housing and um, workforce housing work that we're doing for the planning team. So that's why I asked her to join us today. So your update for the uh, fiscal year 2023 to 24, notice of funding availability for the construction excise tax, which is agenda item number six. So that basically, we posted that earlier in this month. I believe that's been out for between seven and 10 days. Um, we had a couple of different items that went up on different days and became public at those times. But we put a notice in the new in the graphic. We sent a press release out to both um, the graphic as well as the newsberg to help try and get some of the word out about that notice of funding availability. So that folks know the notice of funding availability, the, the total construction excise tax fund accounted for approximately just over $1.5 million. The, um, the direction from city council on that item was for us to, in this round of notice of funding availability, to put out as much funding as possible, but that left $1 million in a next round of funding. And it hasn't been determined when that's going to go through. And per the discussions that occurred back in December with the city council, it's going forward and this and the Affordable Housing Commission is gonna grade those based on the, the criteria and scoring that was developed by the Affordable Housing Commission. And then it will go to the city council for a final decision on awarding for those programs. So kind of what was talked about, um, but I think that that December meeting was good in getting everyone in the same room at the same time to talk about affordable housing and to move forward with those. The due date for that, so there's a, sorry, I think I skipped one of the important numbers, up to $397,000 in, $397,050 is available for the city CEP fund. And that's gonna be for a combination of developer incentives or affordable housing programs. So it's that tier of type of funding that's available through the construction excise tax with the highest level of flexibility. And then um, the applications are due and there's a one-time application window in this case on April 4th. So the application materials have been posted on the website. Leanne is listed as the lead staff member for inquiries to come into. And we have gotten um, a couple of individuals who have already reached out to us and expressed interest. So hoping to get some good projects for you all to evaluate as those come forward. Does anyone have any questions about this one or any other clarifications you'd like? I do have a question. Um, Clay, will um, city staff have a chance to 
kind of ensure that the projects that apply meet the minimum like legal threshold before it comes to this committee for review? So what, yeah, so that's a great question. Thank you, Chair. The, um, what we plan on doing is receiving all of the projects and we'll figure out the best way, but my plan is to anything, anyone that applies and completes the submission process, we will, we will give it to you, but we're gonna identify which ones do not meet the minimum scoring criteria. So if people aren't familiar with it already, kind of a two-part scoring. We don't want to exclude every, anything because we also don't want anyone to think that we missed that or anything like that. So any of those submissions will go ahead and come through, but we're going to identify those that meet kind of test one, which are those minimum thresholds that were established in the scoring criteria. And then your Affordable Housing Commission will then score based on those other remaining criteria, which I would consider test two. Thank and you. then Clay, would the assumption be that at our next meeting in April, that then we would consider those and, and score them. So. That's right. That's what we base that deadline for submissions yeah. on. So we're hoping to do that as soon as we can get those in as soon as we can. Otherwise, we would have liked to have given people a bigger window right. to put things together. But we wanted to get it out there um, after it went to city council, got it up as soon as we could. The flooding in city hall did not help us. Um, you'll be surprised to know. But um, Leanne really hustled up and managed to help us get those out in a pretty timely way, despite the holidays and despite the flooding that came in right at the end of them. So, yeah, so we're pretty happy about that. And yeah, so it'll come for that two step, but we will try and vet those before they come so that it's clear to this commission which have met those those minimum criteria as best we understand. So well, I wanted to piggyback on Larry's question there a little bit um, with the deadline and the scoring system. Are those going to be presented to us at that meeting or are we supposed to have the scoring done for the April meeting? So my the the activity will be evaluating those projects. And so I would expect there to be some discussion, but my hope would be that folks in this group, you'll have a chance to look at those, um, at those projects, that those get brought forward. And maybe you have in your mind more or less what you think that score is, but I would kind of expect, and maybe this is an opportunity for the commission to share what you've done in the past for prior NOPAs and, and responses to them. Um, if you've kind of just taken everyone's vote on what they thought the score was and tally them all up, or if you dialogue about that and decide what you what score seems to be merited as a group. And mm -hmm. I would kind of lead towards those because it is a public hearing. And if everyone goes off and kind of goes to their corners and then just comes back with a number, it might not be an apples to apples kind of a comparison for those, but there's an ability to maintain some level of consistency if you can do that. Um, but it's really at your commission's discretion. I don't believe that we have any criteria that say how you must kind of operationalize that scoring rubric. But I'd be happy to, partially because I have limited uh, experience with this, happy to hear how this group has done this in the past. And I think that would help any of the newer members too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Larry and I can speak to how it was done before, which was the application materials came to us in our packet that we received one or two weeks in advance before the meeting. And as individuals, we could um, we we could fully pre-score it if we wanted to, um, or just you know make some notes on our own. And then when we came to the meeting, we discussed um, the projects individually and had you know a lot of answers questions um time and then we i think we went by category by person what everyone kind of would give for each category and then created an average based on that and then moved on to the next project um, that had applied so there was time to think about it ahead of time but then you could certainly change your answer based on the group discussion before sharing your thoughts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, the, the uh, and just so that you all are familiar with it, our goal is to give at least a week of, of noticing. So the based on the type of committee, statutory law doesn't, statutory kind of state level law doesn't require us to do noticing quite that early, but to be consistent with the city council, the city council has asked that we try and do that wherever possible with the committees to give advance notice and plenty of time for both the commissioners and the public to look through those materials. So, We'll be doing that and shooting for that as a minimum. 
And then um, if we can give any more time than that, we certainly will because we know you'll have a big agenda item for the next one. Mm -hmm. so. and, and Clay, just to, I guess, clarify, we're going to score them and we will send our recommendation to the city council, but they are the deciding body and they will make their decisions. I mean, not necessarily regardless, but you know, they will take our, our input and they will make their decisions. Is that correct? Yeah, the, the Affordable Housing Commission is advisory to the city council. They're not bound by the by the same scoring rubric, but they understand what it is, uh, especially with the joint meeting. I think that they weren't very familiar with how it was developed or how it had been applied in the past. And and so I think that the December meeting that was joint between this commission and the, and the city council was actually really enlightening in a lot of ways to put, put everyone in the same room and get them familiar with what the point was. And knowing that there's kind of that two test process, a minimum threshold plus scoring rubric, I think gave them a lot of understanding that there was there was a level of consistent criteria and scoring that's, that can be applied across those projects. So um, yeah, they're not bound by that. And that was actually something that we had some back and forth with our city attorneys too about making sure that we didn't tie their hands in a way that they're not intended to be tied based on their powers and duties. Well, and I, I just want to clarify, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that necessarily in a negative way. It is just it's good to know in any kind of situation what our role is, you know, and what our role is not. And so it's um, people can get frustrated sometimes if they think they have a certain role and find out later that that really wasn't, you know, we're, we're an advisory board. We're not the decision makers. So I think it's just good to know that ahead of time. I have a question. Um, will we be using the same rubric that the city council will be using as we move forward, as we take each application and we do the rubric, then the group, our group does it. And then is that the same one the city council uses? So are we speaking apples to apples so they can understand where we're coming from? It's intended to be apples to apples, but it's so the Affordable Housing Commission is required to use the, the scoring rubric that's in the Notice of Funding Availability. The City Council will have that use them in an advisory capacity, but they are not required to use it. Although my, my expectation is they will lean on it very heavily. And if they think that there are things that fell outside of it that should be considered, it gives them the ability to do that in their decision-making process. But the whole point of having the Affordable Housing Commission do this is that they can clearly understand that some people looked at some consistent criteria for this, vetted those projects, and came up with a way that is fair at figuring out who, who the most deserving, which are the most deserving projects. So I think it is important, but also preserve some of their autonomy as decision makers. Um, uh, Chair Banks or Commissioner Hampton, do either of you guys want to say any, any more about your experience previously on? how that discussion went. And, and I think that that's pretty clear to me that it sounds like everyone vetted it, scored it on their own, did their homework before class and essentially came prepared to talk about how they had pre-scored those, if that sounds like a good characterization. Um, the process felt very intentional, like, it wasn't too slow. It wasn't too fast. There was plenty of opportunities to ask questions. Um, some members of this group who have been kind of following some conversations over the past year know that we did run into a situation last year where we had an applicant that we didn't even know if we could say yes. And so if that happens again, we may have some like logistical challenges. Um, but if it doesn't happen again, then it's kind of smooth sailing. And we can and we can always address those sorts of things too. It's similar to last time. And I would expect if we get in that, we're not sure if it's a yes. It could always be score it to the best of your ability. Staff carries it forward to city council. Make sure to explain those caveats and perhaps do some research to figure out if it's a yes or no. And can even engage uh, our city attorneys too if there's kind of an interpretation need on on what the code says versus what the project is. So we'd be happy to do those things. Okay. 
Um, any other questions on the construction excise tax notice of funding availability? I do. Um, I'm just for clarification's sake, is is this fund um, grants um, grants and loans or grants only? As I read the application, it it's a little unclear. I mean, I've only gotten through the first page. That one, this this fund is if they ask for a loan, you have the ability to give a loan. If they ask for it as a grant, there's the ability to ask for it as a grant. So this is not, this is a fund as a whole, but I don't think it was largely op, kind of thought out the same way that the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund has much more specific parameters on how those funds can be used. And this is much broader, although I would say that there are buckets of what they can be applied towards, but how they're dispersed, whether in the form of a loan or a grant, or if some, someone comes up with something else, um, then I think those are on the table. For people to consider how they want to request that they be used. So if someone wants a very low interest loan, maybe they think it's more feasible if they ask for it in the form of a loan. For example, they're more likely to get it awarded. They would have that. Most people would prefer to just get money rather than pay the money back. But they also, I could see where someone might feel that it's in their best interest and that it improves their score. Um, but we'll see how those really come in. And um, yeah, so I, I don't think that that's really outlined or talked about in the municipal code sections that we have. Leanne, would you like to add anything to that or does that seem like it characterizes it? Yeah, I don't know that I have more specific information about that. It seems reading through everything like it's more geared towards a dispersal of funds rather than creating something more complicated, um, especially since those funds aren't gonna be replenished. The, um, CET has been sunsetted. So to me, it seems like it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to set it up as a loan. Well, and frankly, our experience, not, not so much with uh, construction excise tax, but with uh, the other accounts, is we don't tend to get a lot of applications for loans. <laughs> Mostly people would like money <laughs> and and would rather not have to pay it back if they don't have to. So I'm not saying we won't have anybody asking, but that has not been the case in the past. Right. I appreciate that. Any other questions on this note, Beth? All right. Hearing none, I will move on to the, the next item, which is the update for the notice of funding availability for the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund. Very similar with different numbers and from a different fund. So the city council authorized this one for an amount up to $64,057. And this would, would be in loans and grants. So as you read through the notice of funding availability, it is much more specific on when and how the funds get used. Also, there is more than a single deadline available for that. The first funding avail, uh, deadline for the notice of funding availability for this, I believe, is in March, although I believe in the memo, I may have written April 4th. I believe that was an error. So I believe the notice of funding availability is actually, Leanne can correct me, but I believe it's March 13th. That's correct. Okay. So I apologize for the error in the memo that was sent out to you all. But um, the time sensitive loans are those that are the time sensitive programs are those that have deadlines. Some of the other ones are rolling. So that's all laid out in the notice of funding availability itself and as well as the program packet. Um, that's available online for folks who are interested in applying. But this one had gone up a little bit from what was expected because one of the awardees from last year was not able to meet a condition that was applied to the, the project that they had. So it was North Valley Friends Church had to meet a certain fundraising goal to ensure, I think the idea from that city council discussion was they wanted to make sure the funds went to a project that was funded enough that it was viable. And so they asked that they make sure they had X number of funds available by a certain date that wasn't met. And so that fund went back into the pool, but that awardee is completely allowed to apply for those funds again, if they should choose to do so. And that was, that was talked about relatively explicitly at that city council meeting back last fall. That was gonna be my one of, one of my questions was what happened with that condition. So thanks for explaining that. No problem at all. And I don't, 
there's not much more to talk about on this one unless there are any kind of nuances associated with these. I'll, the one thing that I would say is that um, the intent and purpose of this is listed slightly differently, but there, it's also for affordable housing. So it's coming from a different place than the CEP funds, obviously. But people who want to apply, they can have the same projects if they're eligible for the right kind of funding, then they could potentially have the same project apply for both the CEP funds as well as the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund. So there's no saying that one project, if it fits the criteria and the requirements, couldn't apply for both sets of funds. So do, are there any questions for staff on, on this one? Well, I, I guess I'll I, ask, so will we then hopefully be also considering those applications at, at the April meeting? Yeah, that's the idea. Um, yes, we will, because that March deadline will come in. So any that are eligible, we'll just include those as a different agenda item. And it may feel a little redundant in your packet, but I would suggest if you're going to do the pre-scoring method when you come in, just to make sure everyone's on the same page, pre-score for CET project and that agenda item, and then and then conduct your kind of review and pre-scoring and come prepared for the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund ones too. Could someone tell me how many apply for each opportunity? Are there a hundred applicants or two applicants? Casey, I like your smile. No? Last year we did have two. Mm -hmm. Does the, staff the anticipate, side. do you anticipate a, a large number of applicants for the CET specifically? We're guessing. So we don't really know how many applicants we'll get. Um, I think we'll get two or more because I've had two different organizations reach out to me already. It is also a, a bigger funding opportunity. So I'm hoping that lures people in. And I think it is very timely to have both of the funding opportunities available for people to try and pick from both of them. So I'm hopeful that, that folks do that and manage to kind of thread the needle on eligibility. Commissioner Rickert, did you have a question? I thought I saw you start to- I did, that. yeah. Um, in our last meeting in October, we started to discuss eligible applicants. And it was something that we wanted to revisit this January meeting. And I think it's under um, item number seven in the mean, um, meeting minutes, the policies and procedures. Um, and I think one of the things that we wanted to, we shelved it, but we wanted to revisit that was um, who's eligible. And I think it was something about the private entities and whether or not we wanted to discuss that in this meeting too. We, um, so, right. So I remember seeing that, especially when I was reviewing the minutes and I will be honest, staff did not have the bandwidth to bring that up and to kind of prepare this and to dive in. Mm -hmm. yeah want to have it so that it's something that comes up at our April meeting we're happy to have that uh, but between um, having Doug retire having fairly new staff and some other things coming up including getting ready for this NOFA that's just something that when we realized that was a request we just weren't able to fulfill it so I apologize for that but we would be happy to look into those eligibility for future funding opportunities because they will be coming up because we know that that's those CEP funds will have another round and the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund, we continue that to keep existing. So happy to do that. Um, to from your from the recollection of those who were there at that last meeting, it was really related to the eligibility of private entities, correct? Yeah, being able to um, ensure that like a private landlord is renting to people who meet the 80% of median income. It was like the logistics of how do we make sure their tenants are without like asking for their tax records or proof of like pay stubs. It just became really convoluted on how do we ensure that the people benefiting um, were kind of in that category. We do have that. Oh. Oh, we're happy to contemplate that. and. And I don't know if there's an interest in kind of talking about that a little further about the challenges that came up um, when you all went through those last time. Although I remember some of that discussion occurring at city council too, where they also had questions about, and is that part of what 
was alluded to earlier about last year with the two applicants, but one of them being unclear if it was appropriate for funding. Yeah. Yes. So I think that was struggle. And when you say private, you mean private for profit. So kind of an independent entity as mm -hmm. opposed to a nonprofit um, 501c3 organization, correct? Correct. Were there any other distinctions that, that you all made or as you talked about things that were other entities that you might want staff to be prepared to talk about or to look into in preparation for that agenda item? So if we think of a traditional 501c3 nonprofit and you think of an independent private property owner, whether that's an individual or an organization, um, are there any other, because I can think of some that might be more like a agency, special district, or quasi, quasi agency, I'm not sure, quasi governmental agency, kind of like, I'm not sure if a housing corporation is exactly a 50C3 or if there's something different. Maybe somebody else here does, but it would be good for us to know what might be good for you to receive as we kind of bring that forward for a discussion. We can look into it ahead of time. I remember there was something about the form that made it very simple to say yes to a nonprofit. And it wasn't that the group wanted to say no to a private. We just didn't know. It, it just it, it didn't feel like there were enough logistical support pieces in place to be able to say yes. I got the sense that um, our group actually would have liked to have said yes. We just didn't know how to, to make sure that it met the the fund's purpose, you know? So if there is a way to offer that for private, um, you know, I can't speak for everyone, but I would still be interested if there's a pathway for that. Yeah, I think, again, part of the, part of the concern is there's built into it the, this kind of a long-term affordability that it's it just seems harder to follow and keep you know keep on top of that make sure that they're continuing to meet that requirement down the road if it's a private thing especially if it's a private where it's you know a, a smaller group they have one apartment or they have or they're one unit that they're doing or something like that you know it 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 seems a little I mean, again, some of that comes down to city staff too, and and city staff being overwhelmed with everything already. And then, is there the one? You know, we're probably not going to go out and search and see if they're meeting, continuing to meet the requirement two years from now or whatever. So, you know, what's the bandwidth? I know there's not a lot of bandwidth for extra checking on some of that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, it just it's it becomes really great for us to okay we could we, it sounds great and we'd like to help these people you know but does it really fit are they gonna you know who's gonna check five years from now to see if they're still renting at this level or whatever we can we can start looking at that and maybe there's something to be done and i'm saying this out loud in part so leanne hears me and we've got it on the recording to think about what we can present to this group and maybe we can try and find some best practices on what entities do for monitoring compliance um, for looking at organizational eligibility and making sure that it's a good appropriate use. Um, I would be open to the possibility that um, maybe only nonprofits were eligible for the grant, but maybe it's more open for the loan option. You know, if it's like a limited term loan, um, something where we know um, we can't predict 30 years of um, compliance, I guess, but maybe within two or three years, we could keep track of that potentially. Well, to a certain extent, the like with the CT, the... CET money. Um, I mean, I think part of the idea too is like a bigger developer. Okay, I'm going to build an apartment complex and I will commit to 10 units of it will be affordable for, you know, whatever time period they need to. 
And, um, you know, that helps the money that they get from construction excise tax helps make that pencil out for them where it wouldn't have otherwise. Um, there, it feels like in that kind of situation, even, even there, somebody who's going to track it, are they, re, you know, is there, are there reporting, um, expectations yearly on what, you know, what they're charging or whatever, that kind of thing. Um, but it, it feels a little easier just in a, in a situation like that, even to, um, to somehow know that, okay, at least, you know, this, these number of units are, you know, continuing to be in, in you know, affordably rented uh, where, you know, the rest are market rate or whatever. Um, so it, yeah, it doesn't, you know, from that standpoint, it doesn't feel like, to, you know, the, the whole incentive thing for developers, which is a big part of construction excise tax is more related to a for-profit builder, you know, to, to, you know, and giving them a reason to even consider doing some affordable work when, you know, it, they're not, they know they're not going to make as much money out of it because they're committing to that. So they're, that's the incentive for them. I have a question. What is the intention of the money amount of money? Is that for profit or nonprofit? You know, what kind of organization is that? Does it have an intention? Do we have that already in the rubric in the application? So that would, um, I, I wouldn't want to exclude others just because they didn't, they want to build something prof, you know, that's affordable, but they, you know, and they are prof for profit or they don't have a nonprofit organization. Yeah, it's not, I mean, the, the whole purpose is to encourage more affordable housing being yeah. built or put into the market. It, it doesn't have anything to do necessarily with, what kind of organization other than just do they have the capability to do that you know and um so uh and again i really it feels to me like the the construction excise tax part of it or at least this a, a portion of it that's for the developer incentives is really aimed more at for-profit people as i was just talking about rather than i mean not not to the exclusion of nonprofits, but that where some of the nonprofits, that's what they do. You know, if it's Habitat for Humanity, they build affordable housing. That's what they do. They may not do as many. You know, what we're trying to do, if maybe we can help them, but also is there somebody else that without this incentive would never, it would never pencil out for them to build affordable units. But with this money, it 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 does work. And I would add that, so each of these, we're working off of whatever's written in the different sections of the municipal code. So both for the Newburgh Affordable Housing Trust Fund and for the Construction Excise Tax Fund, those are both coming out of Title III of the municipal code, which is related to finances for the city. And so to me, it sounds like the Affordable Housing Commission found that the language was somewhat ambiguous about who is supposed to be using this or, or completely silent to the point of trying to figure out what it was. And it sounds like from what Chair Banks had to say that it was more of the mechanism of verifying that, that those funds would continue to be used the way that it was intended, not necessarily the person doing it. The person doing it may have been fine, but it was unclear how it would be kind of maintained. Does that sound about right? Yeah, I remember the, um, the property owner, the landlord talked about, you know, they could willingly enter into some kind of agreement that it would be, you know, rent controlled for X number of years. And, um, you know, it, there was some element of, well, if we offer you this uh, grant to repair um, the driveway and your current tenants are um, uh, considered low income, what's to say that you wouldn't change that within the next two or three months, you know? Um, we couldn't figure out how do we verify that they're not going to use that money, improve it, and then put different tenants with, you know, market rate 
kind of rent in there. Um, that was the mechanism that we just couldn't figure out. So maybe we can come back as staff and see if we can't find some definitions to work with and perhaps some practices for um, that are used in the industry for um, verification and condition compliance purposes and see if we can share anything that would be helpful for consideration. We can also look at what our code sections have about the ability of either the city council or the affordable housing commission to kind of modify, require, or condition things the way that we would do at the planning commission, frankly. I'm not sure that we can, but if there's a gap, but it seems like a viable project that's, that's supported by this commission, maybe it can go forward as recommended for, you know, a certain score, but can also kind of share notes. So keep that in mind too. If, if when you all score these projects, if that travels with notes about considerations or something like that, staff would be happy to do that, although they'd have to be pretty concise. Because if they get to, we can't travel with an entire dialogue or a 15 minute discussion, but we can with a couple of statements about um, that project and its eligibility, viability, um, or concerns. So those, those are all doable things. Commissioner Markle. Can I um, ask a clarifying question to the existing commissioners that have been around a while? Um, historically, have you guys found that you've ended up leaving money on the table or within the fund, the trust fund, because there's been that challenge for some of the for some of the acceptance from from the private, specifically from the private like landlords um, and owners, um, that sort of thing. Yes. I mean, that, yes, we've, again, you know, it's different degrees um, in the, the trust fund side of things. Like I said, on the loan part, which, you know, and there's a certain part of the money that goes to loans and certain part that goes to the grants. Almost never is there, like I said, an applicant for the, for the loan. So that's kind of just keeps rolling over. Uh, for the grants, I mean, we haven't had, we haven't had tons of, people asking um, certain, I mean, I, again, I think some, some people probably are not um, probably, well, as was said before, the, the, the trust fund money, there really hasn't been enough for a bigger incentive for a bigger developer to do something. So we really haven't heard from them. They haven't had the applications where we're hoping the CET money is big enough that it could incentivize some of them to do something bigger. Um, I mean, it seems like, you know, we've worked with Habitat before they, you know, and, and um, you know, but, but they're just, people would, there's, I'm sure there's lots of people who would love to have the money, but, but, you know, fitting into all the criteria and being able to, you know, show that it not and and feeling like for them, it pencils out that that they can then do that. Um, yeah, they haven't been knocking down our door, just trying to trying to get it. I, I, again, hopefully more so with with construction exercise because it is more. Yeah, we also had the reality last year that with the two applicants for a single funding source we could not have fully funded both of them. Right. If we had wanted to fully fund one, we would have had to make a decision about the other. And lo and behold, we ended up dispersing none of it that year. Does does that money roll over, Clay, or does that end up, it does, okay. Yep, That's and that's exactly what I had been mentioning earlier, that the yeah. funding didn't go to that one awardee, so it went to the other. So it doesn't go away, so that's that's a good thing. Uh, but we do we do want to use it. I mean, the whole point is to do affordable housing, and those mm -hmm. take time. So uh, there's kind of the opportunity loss, and you don't want to overlook that. It's always good to if someone's interested, you want to get them. Well, and again, hopefully with the with the two together, it is more of an incentive to get more interest. Mm -hmm. So any other questions on this notice of funding availability? 
And thank you, Commissioner Ricker, for bringing up that one that didn't end up on the agenda because it keeps it on our radar, which we want. Um, if that sounds okay, then I'm going to go ahead and move into the miscellaneous items. And this really ties into the other items that are discussed in the memo that was shared in your packet. So going through some of those. So one of the items from the October 2023 meeting was associated with the Oregon Housing and Community Services, or sorry, I should say, uh, there was a public comment and then discussion about manufactured homes and specifically um, why and how funds should be used towards affordable home housing um, and manufactured homes or those that are both. Um, and there are some limitations that were discussed. I think 1976 was cited several times, but so was 1978. In our research, 1978 was really the year, unless I'm getting it backwards. That's what I thought. Thank you, Leanne. Um, and I'll, I'll let Leanne jump in here on what we looked at a little bit and what we sent over with the agenda as part of attachment one to agenda item eight the Oregon Housing and Community Services Manufactured Housing Replacement Program. Leanne, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you found and saw there? Yeah, so that's a state program um, geared towards uh, replacement of manufactured dwellings for folks. And I don't believe it's just the state of Oregon. Um, I know other places that have been impacted, especially by weather events. The, the government just, I guess, through research has found that those that are pre-1976 um, are typically <clears throat> more, they used materials that are now considered unsafe. Um, they're energy inefficient. Um, so those dwellings, unfortunately, uh, are just, they're not healthy um, dwellings to live in. So it's, it comes to be cost prohibitive to try to refurbish those dwelling units. And the state has determined that it's, it's better to put funds towards replacement of manufactured homes that are that old. So that's what that state program is geared towards. Um, and I imagine, you know, that makes all sorts of sense. Um, I understand there's a need in Newburgh to, to refurbish. Um, there's a need that um, has been expressed in multiple meetings about folks um, needing to upgrade. Uh, however, um, I would imagine that we want to keep folks safe as well. So that's something to be considered when we look at, um, I guess, applications that might be geared towards repairing manufactured homes in Newburgh. Thank you, Leanne. So that was that was one of the things as a follow-up. So I think that the the public comment that came in during that meeting and the dialogue was all a general concurrence that the intent was there and those there's great need, but there were some concerns if things like CDBG funds are already restricted from those uses, it became staff was kind of looking at the why. And why are others not investing in that? And would it be appropriate for the city to do that locally? So that was so that was what we wanted to share with some of the what we found when we looked into that. And that was discussed not only at that October meeting, but I think it was touched on lightly at um, one or two of the city council meetings that have occurred since then, and at the joint work session that occurred back in December. So it's it's come up a handful of times. And I'm kind of going down that list to oh sorry before I move on from that. Did anyone want to talk about that or comments on that further before I kind of keep working through the memo? The only other thing I'll say, I know in the, the December meeting, the joint meeting, too, there, again, there, there was, uh, you know, a desire, a wish that we could do something more, but also I think it's, it could take, with the money that's available, even like, even with three hundred and seventy thousand dollars, you know, you could end up not really even replacing very many. You know, you're not getting a lot more affordable housing places um, out of that money. I mean, it's it is affordable housing. You know, that's in fact, it, some would say our mobile home parks are are some of our 
most affordable housing that we have in New Bern. Um, and, um, and we've lost some over, over time as well already. So, but that, um, yeah, again, it's, it, it's putting quite a bit into each individual home that maybe, maybe houses one or two per, or whatever. And, and, you know, that to a certain extent, the hope with this money is to encourage bigger projects that can maybe incentivize more more for our money, I guess. I'll keep kind of working down the list. Thank you very much, Commissioner. Um, the We just wanted to make sure that we shared the minutes. The work session that was held on December 15th was a joint work session between the Affordable Housing Commission and the City Council since it was joint. The minutes kind of all happen under the city recorder's office as part of the city council. So they received and approved those already. And we just wanted to make sure that you had a copy of that. So that was transmitting those to you. The um, other items that we put in there, one was about the flooding that I mentioned too before. So staff and the community development department, you can still find us, but we're open again. We opened just about a week after that happened. So it happened on a Monday on MLK day. The following Monday, we opened to the public down at the wastewater treatment plant. Don't be scared. It's a very nice place. If anyone has anything they need, they can still find us. So some of our staff are working remote full time, but others are on site every day. So um, if you're talking to someone, particularly if you're talking affordable housing and there are people that have questions and would prefer to do so in person, they can definitely reach us and we're available. Some of the other departments were relocated to other locations. We do not have a, a date when we know we'll be moving back into City Hall by. Our facilities people are still getting estimates from, from folks to do work. So we're, we're looking forward to that, but we don't have a date yet. So we've gotten that question a few times. Um, another item that I put on here was the planning division work plan. There's a few items. I don't think that the work plan discussion was heavily weighed on affordable housing in this case. There were some, I would say, are adjacent or kind of related to that. So specifically, there's legislative updates. We've had a lot, a lot of staff turnover over the last few years. And so making sure we do some long range planning that's, that catches up and stays caught up with state, particularly around housing and affordable housing, that's a lift. And so the turnover in staffing has not been kind to us in, in trying to keep up with those things. So we're hopeful we'll be able to make, meet some of those obligations and make sure that we keep up with those. Another one that I think this group might be interested in because to some extent, I think it can help with the housing affordability issue is the uh, daycare standards and facilities. So there's probably gonna be a development code amendment or some other changes. At, at the very least, an update where we identify what's going on with code requirements on daycares to make it easier. So if you kind of pair housing affordability and then add in some, some easier daycare support being able to be stood up in the area, I think that often helps people in their housing situations. So that's, we're hoping that'll be complimentary. And then the other part that's on the work plan, we still haven't heard anything but short-term rental uh, regulations. Those are in the housing production strategies document that the city received. Uh, back last May, and we're going to see what city council, what kind of direction they give us. We have a meeting later this week that's with the short-term rental ad hoc committee. So that's been going through several phases. At the last meeting back in October, I gave a short update on where we were. Since then, we've met several times with this committee that was created by the city council to talk about and discuss short-term rental policies and where we're at. And what that's going to do is when they've create their recommendation, which could happen as early as this Thursday. When they get that recommendation consolidated, that'll go to the city council. That may or may not be the end of that committee. That might be considered fulfilling what they were asked to do. The city council will receive their recommendation as well as the research that was, that was done and presented to them last September, as well as some of the information that was presented or provided to us by the police department as well as the recommendation that came from the planning commission after they received the research paper. Um, all of those will get rolled up with that short-term rental ad hoc committee recommendation. And then we may or may not get direction from the city council at that point. Based on the conversation, because a couple of the city councilors are on that committee, I think they'll probably give us an assignment of some sort. And they'll basically give us a scope of work and a project. 
and we'll go forward with that based on those things. And that was why we presented it in the work plan, even though it's work we haven't been assigned yet. Because we're already doing some of it and it looks like they're probably going that direction. So those, those I think are the updates, although I wanted to mention one of the things because I can see it in the attachments, listed in the attachments at the bottom of the, the memo, is the CET fund calculation memo, is a memo attached to a memo. And that one is if you're, if you were to go in and read some of the, the narrative associated with the construction excise tax and municipal code, it can be hard to figure out exactly how the money is received, what happens to it when it gets, goes to the city, and then how it gets allocated for the different uses. And so Leanne created this memo for us so that we could really understand what has happened. And to add to the confusion a little bit, there's a provision associated with administrative fees that can be unclear from reading it narratively on when the administrative fee gets removed. And because it's in an account that is interest bearing, the funds are always a moving target. So they always, they always change over time. And one of the things that I would mention too, and Leanne and I will be working to provide updated information each time we talk about construction excise tax fund or when a decision is gonna be required, is that we are in, in the period where people can still request refunds for CET funds. And so we've had a couple of those come in recently, and those were not part of those calculations because the request hadn't come in yet. So that could change how much funding is available, and we're gonna work with our finance department to make sure that we understand exactly how those are being applied. Leanne, do you have anything you wanted to share with them that might be insightful? Um, on the CET calculations that you kind of looked at and when you thought about it? Uh, I don't know. It, it is a moving target. And the way the code section is written is that 4% administrative fee gets taken out of a total um, pre-interest. So as that total potentially is going to diminish in regards to refunds, um, that'll affect everything. So the memo with that flow chart sort of breakdown was created um, prior to what Clay just mentioned. So um, it is an interest bearing account. I've done some of the math. It's, it's gonna change a little bit though as those refunds um, we'll, we'll have to assess them to make sure that they um, those requests are valid and then um, go through that process and kind of recalculate everything. So we're going to be partnering with our finance department to make sure that that everything is tracked. Um, that's essentially what you said. <laughs> so we'll just be, uh, I guess, supplying updates to that with funding as we get it. Chair Banks, do you have a question? Comment and question. Um, as a visual learner, deeply appreciate this green chart. That is, that just helps clarify so much. Thank you. Um, I had been under the impression that the deadline for refunds was over. Um, is there a firm deadline? There is. So people are allowed to request a refund for one year after the fee was paid. So when will so, the one year be up? So I would suspect. So we weren't, um, so the period where people can request a refund or would be eligible for a refund potentially mm -hmm. is where they've been both assessed, which assessed and invoiced, I believe are being used pretty much interchangeably at this point, and paid the refund. Obviously, if you don't pay, pay the item, you can't get, you're not gonna be getting refunded for it. But if that happened on or after April 1st, 2023, and then before, and then it, and then we sunset it on July 1st. So hopefully we haven't charged anyone after July 1st. If you got charged after July 1st, you're definitely eligible for a refund. And hopefully we didn't do it. But I don't recall. I don't recall having seen that. Um, and so that sets the, the time period where that refund eligibility occurs. And then there is another statement that says individuals may request a refund. And this applies to other criteria when there's a couple other, I believe, one other subsection where there's a provisions on when people can request refunds. Um, 
And so then they have a one year from the payment date to request the refund. So that's the time frame in which you may apply. So if they are a year plus a day after they paid it, they're not in that, I can make the ask at that point. So there's not a scenario where we're going to meet and potentially approve, you know, projects for a dollar amount that then, oops, we actually don't have enough money because of pending refunds. Like we're not in a position where that's going to accidentally happen, right? Not that I'm aware of because we haven't made that much available at this point, but that would be a good timeline consideration for when that one million dollars that the city council wanted to leave set aside for the next funding round to make sure we don't kind of over award going into that so when so we could continue moving forward but we might not want to make the awards for those until we know we've cleared the date for all of those refund requests so i think that's a good consideration it's something leanne and i have been talking about as well and so how does that work into our changing the math and the allocations that are available to folks well, and it seems to me, if I if my memory's right, that the like the developer incentives can be part of either part of the construction excise tax, the the money that's given out. There's kind of the two different branches, the 35% and the whatever part. And kind of. <laughs> sort of at least. So because we're yeah, because we're dealing with the smaller amount, it yeah, we're probably not in danger of dipping below what the certain percentage of what whatever is available. Well, there's it's it's unfortunately it's a little more complicated than that, I think, in that the the funds get split as whether they're commercial or residential first. And the commercial, a hundred percent of those go into the and category, developer incentives and affordable housing program. So that's that's good. That's the one when I kind of talk about that bucket, that bucket is the high flexibility bucket. Then there's the percentage, then under residential, they have three subcategories instead of just the one. They have that and category, and that is only, Leanne, is that only 35% in the and category? Yes, and that's the one where that 15% goes back to the state as well. Yep. Exactly. So residential has 35% and 15% goes back to the state for housing programs, which which local folks can apply for, but we're we're in a much bigger pool of competition. And then then 50% of that resident those funds coming from residential are just developer incentives. So yeah. So but those that we released in this round, we gave the highest level of flexibility for this round or at least that's how we're talking about them so far. We'll probably end up talking to finance depending on the projects that actually get funded and, and perhaps city attorney and say, should we be pulling from one bucket or the other if, if someone pulled from that and category, but it was a developer incentive, do we have to pick which one it came from and at what time do we have to make that decision? Or is it because we declared it openly? We did that in, in part just to make it on this first round as simple as possible. That's it. Does anyone have any other questions on that? Or did we answer all the questions that were asked? All right. I think, I think from a staff perspective and agenda items, that's all that we have now um, on here for miscellaneous items. The next meeting is scheduled for April 23rd, 2024. Um, are there any re additional requests for agenda items that you would like to have added to that one. You're, I expect you to be reviewing projects, so it's probably gonna be weighty to start with. We're gonna try and bring the eligibility item, I'm saying that out loud so that when we watch the recording again, we all catch it. Um, is there anything else that's requested from this group? Okay, and the chair told us that, that she's unlikely to be here, so our new vice chair, looking at you, Vice Chair Brown, um, is likely to to be managing that meeting. Depends on if I can find a Wi-Fi connection. We'll see. Okay. So Play. knowing that we're going to be having all these grants to review and it's a yeah. substantial portion of this commission's responsibility to do that. Um, I will make a concerted effort to be there and, um, you know, um, 
we've all chosen to be here. So we don't meet very many times. So our absence is definitely felt when we are absent. Yeah, anything before we adjourn? Well, Clay, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but I'm going to put you on the spot. So we have a new community development director coming in. I, that doesn't mean you're out on the street, I hope. It, it does not. So I'm still the planning manager. It's just I get to wear an extra hat for the last couple of months. So no, uh, and you're nearly me. <laughs> He's not allowed to go anywhere. <laughs> I'm uh, I'm serving as if anyone hasn't hasn't met him yet. This is Will Worthy. He's our city manager, so he's not just some guy that's chiming in at the end. Well, he is just some guy, but you know, <laughs> I am just some guy. I'm a librarian, but I was enjoying <laughs> very much just listening, getting a bit of education. So thanks for putting up with me. <laughs> No, so, I, so I'm currently just serving as the interim community development director and have been since Doug rode off into the sunset on November 1st. And, um, and so who we've got joining us is Scott Siegel. Um, so if, if you haven't done any Googling of who he is so far, he's got a great background. And I think we're really lucky to get him. I think we successfully stole him from another entity. So that's exciting too. To, you know, I'll take that as a win. Ruthlessly steal somebody else with good staff. And um, and we're really excited to have him. So I think that he's going to bring a breadth of experience that will be really valuable here in Newburgh. And he's uh, so far, he's making good impressions because he, he emailed us and offered to help move boxes the day after the kind of the flooding had happened. So that seemed like a, we didn't take advantage of that gesture, but we appreciate it. So and that's all I've got, I think. Well, thank you. I guess we'll see each other in April, if yeah. not sooner. Can you remind store. me, do I declare adjournment or do I ask a motion to adjourn? You you declare it adjourned. You are the chair. If you had a gavel, this is when we, you use it. My gavel's in my office, but we are adjourned. See you in April. Thank Thanks you all. Everyone. Good night.